I started college in engineering and focused a lot of motivation on trying to figure out what I really wanted to do for a career. I didn't have a clear role model. Uh, my father was an artist. My mother was a school teacher. So I was really exploring what I wanted to be. Some colleagues wanted to be doctors. I was thinking engineering was technical. I liked the idea of building things. Uh, but once I had some experience working as an engineer, I didn't enjoy it. But I wanted something to do. I wanted to earn a living. And most of my roommates had gone to graduate school in psychology. So I thought, I'll give it a try. And I really had a wonderful first year at the University of San Diego. And I was really thought that I was on track, that I really found something that I'd like to do. And um, so I stayed with it. I actually transferred to Yale to finish graduate studies. Um, and I've enjoyed it as a career, so I think it was a good choice. Um, I still go into the office at age 67, um, almost every day during the week, and I enjoy it. Um, I can't say it was a maximizing decision because I didn't do the alternative. I don't know what the alternative would be. Um, but I basically got into it because of uh, imitating other decision makers. It sounds like I'm making a story up, but um, when I was an undergraduate, I took a series of courses from a famous, famous in the, in the United States philosopher, uh, and the courses were on the philosophy of decision-making, decision theory. Um, he'd actually collaborated with economists and conducted experiments measuring utility functions in the 1950s. Um, his name was Patrick Soupies, um, and he was kind of a role model for me. Um, and so I really wanted to study that topic because of the courses I took from him. It also happens that just when I was starting graduate school, um, Edwards' work was very popular and Kahneman and Tversky's heuristics work was just published. And um, I was very interested in cognitive psychology and I saw the Kahneman and Tversky research as pointing in a cognitive direction a little bit away from Ward Edwards' direction um, to cognitive studies of decision-making, and those really excited me um, right from the beginning of graduate school. Well, it was very mixed. Um, obviously, the research was enormously popular in the sort of popular academic's eye, uh, but many of the people I was with were extremely critical um, because the methods were very quick and dirty. This is the heuristics research. Um, both of them conducted more careful experiments in other lines of research on attention in Kahneman's case and on uh, choice and uh, utility theory tests in Tversky's case. Uh, and so there were objections to the heuristics and biases because they were so, um, the, the experiments were all these short questionnaire brain teaser tasks. And many traditional psychologists who were my mentors um, rejected those methods. Um, there was general excitement though about the basic idea that the judgment under uncertainty processes were essentially um, cognitive processes like memory, association, similarity, rather than um, sort of a variation on a probability equation. Um, so there was mixed reactions. Well, that's a sort of an audience problem because the things that sort of grab me and interest me don't often interest other people. Um, I think my research on the central role of narrative thinking and story construction and the role stories play in jurors' decisions was probably the biggest impact theme in my research. 
um, the conclusion that jurors are actually spending most of their time in the courtroom trying to construct a story. Other people had alluded to that, but no one had really spelled out what that might mean very precisely. Um, so that probably the world outside of me probably would say that's the biggest insight. Well, there's something essential about stories and human nature. And there are um, cheesy arguments so f about how the brain is designed to be a story processor. I don't know about the brain, but I think we are um, very tuned to sequential narratives that are driven by h human person-to-person -person relationships. So human motivations, um, temporal sequences, challenges overcome, uh, sort of episodic pauses um, where there's a, a short-term goal has been achieved. There's something about thinking that way that's very natural to us. Um, we ser seem to learn effectively when information, even mathematical or biological information, is put into a story. Um, so there's something fundamental about stories in human nature. I don't quite know what it is. Um, it's not a surprise to me that things like legal decisions, military planning, diplomatic thinking, it's all driven um, by sort of narrative um, coherence and narrative constructions. Um, the way we respond to vivid exemplars that are in the form of short stories there's got to be something essential about stories. It's cross-cultural. Children respond to it. Um, it's got to be essential. Uh, I don't think we really understand it that well, but that's probably why people respond to the juries or constructing stories concept so positively. Well... I think there's a, a lot of confusion in the wisdom of crowds area because the research is dominated by the easiest tasks to study and most of those tasks are simple estimation task or um, trivia category answer tasks like you know which city is larger um, Bonn or Heidelberg. Um, most of the tasks, including decision tasks that groups do, are extremely complicated, and the only way to perform those tasks is with more than one person. You cannot write a legal contract or value a corporation that you're going to buy, or in my view, even hire effectively if you're a hiring committee, unless you combine the points of view from several people. That is... Different people have different parts of the answer, um, and you really have to put the pieces together. Most of the research has not studied questions where there is much information to pool or share. Um, and since I think that most of the big decisions that groups are asked to make involve um, pooling information that no one person can have, um, that most of the decisions that we allocate to groups have to be done by groups to be done well. Well, it depends. Um, I, I do usually enjoy committees and teams. Um, it depends on what the decision is and who's on the team and so on, but I like collaborative work. Um, my only comment there is that you, you can't just expect um, social decisions to work spontaneously. You either have to train up like you do for an athletic team or a military squad, um, or you have to plan extremely carefully what the decision process is. I think the biggest error that occurs in group and team decision making is mixing up the generate ideas, generate solutions part of the process 
and the sort of more obvious choose or decide on the solution part. And I think many, many committees confuse those two processes. And so they start off trying to generate solutions, but then they don't do a very good job because they add the critical part into that part of the process. I actually think, although research does not clearly support this, I actually think separating the divergent thinking from the convergent um, critical thinking is um, a, probably the most important error that that is not done in um, a lot of teams and it should be done more carefully. Well, juries I don't think is a a good example. Um, there is a sense in which juries often screw up their task, and um, this comes directly from research I've done. That is, they move straight into a adversarial argumentative phase, um, and they ask each other, who of you think the defendant is guilty? Who of you think the defendant is innocent? Okay, we have five to seven. Let's have a debate. I think it's a mistake for the jury to go straight to the debate decision critical process. I think the best juries start off by saying, we may disagree about the decision, but before we turn to the decision, let's try to see what we can conclude if we put our heads together about what the facts are. Let's not worry about whether it's a robbery or an innocent defendant. Let's worry about what happened try to figure that out, and then after we've figured out what we agree and disagree on about the facts, then let's go to the decision phase. So there's a little bit of an analogy, but I don't think the jury does too much divergent thinking. I think their task is so focused by the law, they don't generate solutions. The judge tells them, you can find the defendant guilty of murder, guilty of manslaughter, or not guilty. That's all you can choose. So the jury is a bad group to talk about if you talk about divergent idea generation. Uh, but juries have a sort of an analogous error. They go into the debate part of the decision too quickly. So just to pick a typical example, the last time I was on the job market, I had three jobs that it, I just couldn't quickly choose between. And I would do the usual experience of cycling between the jobs. In the morning, I would like job A. and lunchtime, I would prefer B. And in the evening, I would prefer C. And then the cycle would go on the next day. Now, for someone like me, um, that's a signal um, of a difficult decision. And I have a procedure to deal with those decisions. I don't um, argue that it's the ideal. But I think the crucial recipe is to cycle between analytic thinking and intuitive thinking. So in the case of the three jobs, let's stay with that example, I carefully summarized in a written form and actually a spreadsheet, the characteristics of the jobs, what I thought were the major pros and cons for the jobs. So basically I did a multi-attribute utility analysis. Um, but I didn't let that make the decision for me. I just carefully studied it, worked on constructing it, used other people as a sounding board, particularly my wife, um, and then I let myself basically go intuitive and ruminate on it for a couple of days. Um, and the decision still wasn't um, an easy one. That is, the answer didn't pop up um, easily. I also, when I'm doing that, I try to ask myself what part of the decision is hard. And I'm following a pretty conventional analysis. I say, is it something about missing information, about the facts, about the situation, about what an economist would call the uncertainties or the probabilities? Um, or is it something about my preferences? Um, am I unable to figure out whether I like or don't like certain aspects of one of the options or another? And what I often discover in my personal life for the decisions that are difficult 
is that the problem is that the, the decisions are relevant to several goals. Now, you could say, oh, that just is multi-attributes, but for me, um, it's different. When you choose a job, you're choosing um, a, for goals that apply to your family and your children, you're choosing for lifestyle goals, you're choosing for professional goals, and those goals aren't all, all the same thing. And so your evaluations keep changing um, because you shift sometimes without thinking about it from goal to goal. Well, I don't have a technical definition. Um, I have always kind of accepted the both the Aristotelian and Ken Hammond's version of it notion um, that our thoughts range from a relatively unconscious, unreportable uh, side of the spectrum to a controlled, analytic end of the spectrum. Everything we do uh, cognitively is a mixture of unconscious and conscious, um, but it's intuitive when it's less controlled deliberately and it's more towards the unconscious can't report it end of the distribution. So when I talk about going intuitive, I do the analysis, for instance, carefully think about all the features of the jobs, worry about what goals are supposed to be achieved by this decision, um, and then I just stop thinking about it um, systematically for a few days. Um, and I just, you know, it'll come to mind sometimes when I'm walking, so it may not be completely unconscious. Uh, but I'm not forcing myself to systematically work through the decision. Well, there's technical, very micro decisions in cooking when you decide what spices to add. I, I did do all the cooking in my family. Uh, my wife didn't like to cook, and, um, and uh, it was kind of a a very positive role that I was the cook and my children still come to me and ask for favorite recipes and ask me to cook for them. And sometimes they'll come to my apartment and surprise me and cook dinner for me and have it waiting when I come home. So cooking actually has played a big role in my family life. Um, but there's these little technical low-level decisions. I don't think there's anything special about those. I guess what's interesting about cooking decisions is you're trying to infer what other people will like, and you're often trying to infer what will be pleasing to several different people. And often, if it's a special meal, I'm trying to infer what haven't they had before that they'll really like. And uh, those decisions are incredibly uh, intuitive and unpackable, and I have no clue as to how to explain them. They're almost artistic decisions. And I can't say that, I, like any artist, I can't say I always hit the center of the target every time. Uh, but uh, So I'll just have to leave cooking decisions to uh, the intuitive realm, where I can't really explain how you do it. Well, I don't think there's a dichotomy. I think genetics gives us some built-in preferences. Um, and I have no idea where to draw the line and that we acquire a lot from learning. Um, so, um, you know, if I experience a certain type of movie, um, then I'll look for other movies that are similar to that movie. Um, I mean, you could say that if all preferences are basically connected to subjective feelings and the subjective feelings are wired in, that you have to be able to reduce them all to something that you're endowed with innately. But I actually believe the contents of the mind, you might say the language of thought, is a mixture of taken in empirically from the environment and genetically given. So I think preferences are a mix of the two as well. Um, I actually believe that there's going to be a radical change in the way decision-making is studied and defined, and I can't describe it very well. 
but let me give you um, sort of an incomplete example. If you think about how most decisions are made, my decision to go to graduate school, my decision to buy a house, uh, even my decision to visit the Max Planck Institute, they're driven by opportunities that evoke goals in your environment. You don't sit down and construct a decision set and say, which cell phone am I gonna buy? You say, you know, I need a cell phone. How can I achieve that goal? Well, I could just buy one like my brother has. That would solve it. And you may stop with that, and you'd almost hardly say that's a decision at all. You just said, I've got a goal. Here's the obvious path to the goal. I'll take it. And so I think the field is going to shift to more of a how do people construct decision problems in the first place orientation. And I think that's going to change the character of the calculation that people do when they actually make the decision. And I think there's a hint of that in some of the, in some of the choice heuristics that are being developed at ABC and elsewhere. Uh, a movement away from there's a fixed choice set, how do we evaluate each of the options and how do we pick the option that stands out as the best to a more I'm trying to navigate to that goal. I need a car. How do I get there? What are the paths I take to get to owning a car? It won't happen tomorrow, but in the next 20 years, I think there's going to be a shift to a more goal-driven, problem-solving way of thinking in a clear scientific way about decision-making. Mm-hmm.